to move forward. Okay. Um, so in this first uh, sort of substantive uh, presentation, what I'm going to be covering is a vision for systems data science. Um, uh, a vision that is at once drawing on elements of system science and data science, um, but bringing them together, and yet bringing them together in a way that's more than just a, a sum of them, more than just putting them side by side. It brings them together in a way that not only complements them, but synergizes them. Um, and I argue that there's really a new paradigm emerging, which is different and from and transcends either of those, those parent paradigms as, as important and as rich and deeply grounded as they are. But in order to do that, particularly given the diversity of participants here, um, the fact that any one person will often lack any exposure to one or the other of these domains, I, I want to situate you in these in each of these domains. Talk about each of them on its own terms before we talk about how they can work together uh, uniquely. Um, and uh, I recognize that for any given participant, this may lead to you uh, going over material with which you are at some level familiar. Um, but I'll go over that material with a, a certain perspective that may be different. Right? For example, with dynamic modeling, uh, I'll be lending it a perspective of models as learning prostheses, which is likely to be novel to, to someone who hasn't attended uh, my other boot camps. Um, and uh, for data science as well, I'll, I'll give it a certain um, sort of perspective that comes from our work that might be a little bit different. So hopefully, all pieces of this will offer you some, some value. Okay, so um, I've just shared my slides and I'm gonna drag this window over to the other monitor there so that um, we get it out of the way. Ladies and gentlemen, please let me know if, if at any point you see the black window of death on my screen. Uh, occasionally in my teaching, uh, I'm distressed to hear after I've given a lecture with screen sharing that there is a black window of death obscuring parts of the screen. Um, and, uh, and this will be something which um, uh, will uh, happen without my being aware of it during the talk. Um, it's something which there's actually a window behind my main one. Uh, and, and I need to be told about it by others. Um, there's a comment in the uh, in the presentation about uh, some of this material being available. It is true that some of this I've presented, but I can assure you, because I've made substantial modifications that no one here um, will have seen uh, all this presentation before. Uh, some of the slides are in fact uh, novel uh, to to this particular rendition. So uh, this material is, is fairly rapidly evolving and uh, it will be um, novel to, to those present. Um, okay, so um, the motivation here um, for, for many um, lies in, in the spheres of health policy or the spheres of health service delivery, um, where we're confronting um, challenges of a, of a growing character that, um, that are a hallmark of our, of our current age. Um, uh, and, you know, depending on your particular sphere of, of concern, um, mental health and addiction service delivery, uh, concerns about uh, infectious disease spread and, and uh, uh, communicable disease endemics, um, you know the burden of 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 uh, health uh, health disparities uh, within our population in chronic diseases um, or or resurgent zoonoses, whatever the area, um, we're dealing with 
uh, with entangled policy challenges and health service delivery challenges, which are, are, are often um, uh, far, far more complex and uh, involved in uh, dynamically challenging to deal with than what we were dealing with uh, a century ago, for example. Um, and you know, observers over the past few hundred years have have, have long noted um, uh, the sort of puzzling patterns that come up uh, within uh, observed um, health health data. This going back to the 1700s with uh, bubonic plague and and patterns of, of repeated cycles and childhood infectious diseases prior to vaccination, uh, whether uh, worldwide, these from England and Wales, um, and these from closer to home here in, in Saskatchewan. These patterns, these patterns of, of um, ordered regularities um, uh, transcend uh, any one area. It's not a matter of infectious diseases. It's not just a matter of, uh, you know, something curious that happens with zoonoses, like the concentric spread of, of rabies, for example. It's something which comes up again and again. And while um, some of the discoveries occurred first in, in communicable disease about the dynamic nature of the processes, you know, recent decades have, have established uh, that in spheres that are, are um, commonly thought of as as uh, less dynamic, such as chronic diseases, um, many of the same phenomena take place, such as in the network spread of obesity as documented by Christakis and Fowler. Um, we've all been through and continue to um, be subject to, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and decision makers there, like in countless other areas, were dealing with um, an evolving situation evidenced by observations from the world. Uh, but what's notable is that these observations for the world these days are becoming not only more numerous based on, on extra uh, surveillance data collection systems that we have, but they're also interconnected. Um, and you know, if we look at any one components of these time series, um, we'll find that um, far from being solitudes, they have some relation to one another. Um, uh, for example, if you look at cases and test volumes, um, uh, we may think of them as two separate time series, but of course, uh, uh, one whispers of the other. Um, uh, people uh, who are tested uh, often become cases, and you know the observation of large numbers of, of individuals needing to present for care now will often drive test volumes in the near future. Now, you know, when we're dealing with a, a world which is tossing at us constantly, these observations over time, uh, there's uh, a frequent need to, to render that information in a way that's useful. And I wanna highlight two areas where there's, you know, ubiquitous need to make sense of this information um, and a need for, for prioritizing it for practical means. And one of them is, is to understand you know, what's going on and where's this likely to be going? Um, where are we headed in terms of these higher, ever increasing service volumes over the last five years? Um, what are we likely to see for the fall for the, for the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, or for, you know, for uh, tick-borne illness or influenza this year after several lull years. Um, but another need, of course, which which confronts all health systems, is where to invest the limited uh, amount of money available, the limited resources, human resource available, um, to best secure uh, the the health of the population. Where to invest resources for action. And there it's making choices. We can't do it all. What are we going to do? Um, how are we going to marshal our limited resources for greatest effect? Now, when it comes to this sort of um, cavalcade of data that, with which we're presented, this, this cacophony of, of, of data sources, 
that uh, with which we're often confronted now. Uh, data from helplines, data from from uh, health service delivery, such as in uh, hospital admissions and ICU admissions, uh, public health data involving testing a number of cases, uh, wastewater data, bring new factors to the table, data from social media um, regarding, uh, regarding posts there, uh, and data from smartphones on population mobility patterns. Um, uh, you know, to, to make sense of that, um, there's been two separate traditions which have really come to the fore and which in some sense can be seen as kind of vying for mindshare for how to engage um, with, with this observation about the world in order to inform decision-making, in order to inform understanding and, and projection and prediction. Um, and the two rich computational traditions are listed as follows. There's system science on the one hand, and there's data science on the other. Um, uh, and each of them is uh, formidable in, a, in bringing a set of techniques and a perspective to bear within the sphere um, that can inform practical needs. Um, we're gonna be talking about each of them focusing first on the system science perspective. And again, I wanna do this to make sure that, you know, those within the spook camp, as we're talking about synergizing these two, um, have, have some, at least a little bit of a rooted understanding and, and what each of these brings to the table. Um, uh, system science techniques within health were in some, in, 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 in many ways, they, they emerged out of, observations concerning uh, communicable diseases, the work of McDonald and Ross starting in, in 1916 and Kermick McKendrick in the late 1920s, for example, was seminal within this area. And um, what, what these pioneers identified was that um, there is utility in taking these patterns in the world for, with all their richness and analyzing them um, not simply in their own right, but as manifestations of, as, as reflections of, as faces of an underlying system. Um, and uh, you know, here, these are almost invariably nonlinear dynamical systems, which mean that they're often surprising. Uh, their impacts are pervasive. You you invest you uh, hit it in one place, it pops out in another. Um, it exhibits uh, uh, an evolution that, uh, in order to understand it, you can't predict it ahead of time um, and just write down a formula for it. You need to simulate it out, and it has a bunch of other implications. Some of the most important of which are that when we combine. Um, two policies, the impacts of both may be extraordinarily different from what you think from either in isolation or the sum of, of those results of each in isolation. So here, this underlying system um, was seen as kind of giving rise to these observations in the world. And what we see here is kind of the face of some complex processes underlying. And in many ways, um, I like to, to think of of this observation through the lens of, of Plato's analogy of the cave. Um, Plato spoke, um, you know, over 2000 years ago uh, about the uh, importance of, of uh, recognizing there's a difference between epiphenomena and, and, and the factors that draw, give rise to it. He spoke about a cave where prisoners um, uh, placed over here in chains were uh, presented with uh, with uh, dioramas involving these these shadows cast um, by these players here holding them up, and the prisoners became convinced that you know what was cast on the wall as shadows were in fact um, real situations. They they reflected uh, the reality of the situation that the shadows were the world, uh, and 
uh, the reason about the shadows is actors within this context uh, interacting and engaging with each other. Um, and of course, he, he noted that, um, that we need to move beyond being like these prisoners in the cave and reason about the world and all its richness, reason what we would call about the generative mechanisms now, the causal structure of the system that gives rise to observations. And observations about the world, uh, observations we make um, concerning things in the world from this perspective are not the defining features of the world. They are reflections of an underlying set of processes that should form our, our more fundamental focus because it's by changing those processes that we can, we can alter what we see from the world. It's by intervening in those processes, these causal pathways, these generative processes um, that, that, that are, are in the underlying world that are not themselves directly visible. And from a system science perspective, modern, um, uh, modern much of the, the history of modern science over the past uh, 200 years can be seen as, um, while very valuable and important, um, often falling prey to a reductive perspective where you know, we're dealing with each piece of a system, but without dealing with the system as a whole. And what system science argue, has argued is that beyond the reductive uh, approaches, which are extremely important, we need to, to have a system uh, science. We need a, a science of the whole that will be dealing with the elephant as a whole, not merely each of its parts in isolation. We need to recognize that there's a system here that's bigger than the sum of its parts. And um, practitioners within this area have noted, you know, that, that uh, absent that perspective, you constantly run in with complex systems to a set of challenges. Um, uh, challenges which stymie effective action to improve the situation. These include counterintuitive behavior from the systems, misperceptions of that system, um, uh, policy resistance to the system cases where you intervene and your interventions are diluted or effectively um, uh, diminished um, uh, by the system itself pushing back. And we need to recognize there are tipping points in, in cases where if we can only invest enough, just a little bit more investment can make a qualitative difference in dramatically improving the mental health of the population or reducing overdose deaths or, or um, you know, causing an infectious disease which has been endemic to die out. And you know, when we're dealing with these complex systems, um, um, we're often, if lacking an understanding of the, the whole elephant, lacking an understanding of the, the components that give rise to these observations to the world, we're often, you know, at, at real loggerheads in order to learn from experience, to coordinate across the system, to plan and decide how to structure a system. Um, uh, is, is really challenging because we're dealing with the shadows cast on the wall. We're dealing not with the underlying system, but the, the phenomena that give rise to it, uh, that it gives rise to in a way that, that sets us up for um, pursuing shadows instead of, instead of altering the things that, that really make a difference. Um, and it often will, allow, will lead us to make decisions which um, might seem sensible on the face of it um, in terms of the patterns we see in terms of the observations over time we've observed thus far, but which have very deleterious consequences because they don't deal with how the system works. And so we may end up, for example, terribly imbalancing a system between acute care on the left and community care on the right in a way that makes our health systems go around in circles. Um, we think you know, we have a long set of delays associated with emergency department waiting times. And so we invest in the emergency department um, and you know, not capturing the fact that the reason we see these problems in the emergency department is because the wards are full. And the wards are full because people are stuck in, um, in beds who 
should have been discharged to the community and they're stuck in those beds because the community services are not available. Um, and if we don't understand what is giving rise to these patterns of long ED waits, we're doomed to, to just uh, repeat our failures in trying to deal with them. We will create new waiting rooms that will just fill up. We will uh, put in place you know, new major investments that will make an area difference in the waiting times within a few years. Um, so reductionist perspectives, uh, uh, from, from a system science perspective, reductionist approaches um, have a formidable place they, they play in allowing, supporting and understanding of the pieces of, of a system. Um, uh, and, but there's a need for something more than that. Just like as Barry Richmond used to say, uh, a pioneer in the system dynamics area, when you go to build a house, you need more than specialists. You need the general contractor. You need the person who puts it together into the whole piece. And if we want to put in place fixes that stay fixed within our health system, we need, we need something more than the pieces. So the perspective of system science is we need to reason about the underlying processes. Much as in Plato's cave, we need to reason about the, the components of the world, not merely the shadows cast on the world, we, we, or on the wall. Um, so we need to reason about these underlying processes. And, and the observation is if we don't, we'll work against the nature of the world. And like King Canute, we'll order the tide back without an understanding that that's not possible. Um, instead of putting our energy into something that is, we'll put it into something that's futile will declare policies dead before they have time to reach their fruition, because we won't recognize that in fact, there was a certain amount of time needed to accomplish that. So here we're focusing on this underlying set of systems. Um, and the science of the whole um, uh, seeks to, to give us ways of, of accomplishing this by reasoning about generative mechanisms. And, and uh, the perspective here uh, is that we will often use dynamic models, these models of the mechanisms, models of the generative pathways to reason about these patterns we see from the world. Models here are not the truth, but they are thinking processes that get us, that speed us towards that truth. So they help us learn more, more quickly. And the idea is if we were just reasoning in our head based on our mental models that we all invariably use, rather than formal computational models, um, if, if, if we, uh, we, we may make uh, those classic mistakes of having difficulty to learn from, our, um, from, from uh, past observations, difficulty coordinating. But if we, if we have models that are computationally capture those patterns, they help us learn more quickly. And, and why did they do so? because they capture the logical consequences of our thinking. And they more quickly help us realize when things just don't add up in the way we think they, they, they would. Um, they help us more quickly cross check when our cherished understanding is off base. So they help us think more quickly, thoroughly, reliably, and rigorously about our theories about the world and help us contrast them with evidence for the world to test when our theories just don't, aren't consistent with the evidence. They produce, they produce predicted observations that, that fall short of, of uh, matching evidence in the world. So the idea here is models are not crystal balls, rather they are more like uh, an artificial leg or, or a crutch or a cane or a, um, a wheelchair, why? because those types of real world prostheses um, involving, uh, involving uh, physical limitations help us achieve near full physical capacity despite our inherent limitations. They help us walk despite having an, a leg amputated. They help us um, make our way down a corridor despite having a broken foot. Uh, and models are like that in another way, they're thinking processes. Um, th they're not dealing with a physical limitation, but a cognitive and mental limitation. Um, they help us complement our 
our, our body's limitations, our mental limitations um, with, with some supplements that will help us uh, achieve near full function, just as a crutch will despite a broken, broken leg. Um, they're not crystal balls. They don't tell us what is, but they more quickly clue us in to when our thinking is off base. Um, so the idea here is models help us refine our mental model, help us uh, help challenge us to make observations around the world, which challenge that mental model more. And they do so by telling us the logical consequences of our thinking and helping us spot when it just doesn't add up to those observations about the world and help us know what we anticipate should happen with our with our uh, simulation model when we undertake some action and comparing with what actually does. Um, so while thinking in our head through informal reasoning um, about, for example, whether a given set of understanding about the world is consistent with the observation is very hard. With a model, a dynamic model, we have a way of operationalizing this theory, theorized understanding. We have a way of putting it into an operational form, a runnable form, which we can run, say what empirical observations would we expect, and we can compare them with the world and use that to then refine our, our theory. That's not something we can do in our head. It is something we can do with a, with a model. So these models help us learn more quickly. And you know, Francis Bacon said it in the, the, the 1600s, truth sooner emerges from error than from confusion. It's not that the model is correct. It's by putting something out there, testing it, finding that it's off base and correcting it, we're further ahead. We fail early, we fail often. Whereas if it's just sitting in our head, we don't, it, we have this inchoate idea about what its implications will be. We can't really test it. We can't really refine it against the crucible of evidence uh, that Francis Bacon spoke about in the scientific process. So, um, uh, so that's uh, important use of models. But once you develop confidence in a model, once you develop, you know, um, a degree of, of uh, conviction that the model's capturing some regularities in the world, the other thing we can do is ask about counterfactuals with it. We can ask about situations we haven't yet observed um, and ask, okay, if this theory of the world, if we, if we posit this theory of the world, what would the consequences of those be? If we try to do this in our head, if we try to ask, you know, what will have the greatest effect in bending the curve for the pandemic or in lowering overdose deaths for, um, for those uh, using opioids? Um, or you know, what would help best contain the spread of, of Lyme disease in Canada? Um, uh, if we do those in our head, you know, uh, if we explore those ideas in our head, um, it's really hard to, to assess the trade-off between choices. Where with a model, we actually have a way of doing that. We, we have a way of mapping this theory to, to what we expect to happen over a world that's mechanical. It's, it, it captures you know, the generative pathways or a certain abstraction of them. And we can put in place an intervention in said model and see what the consequences are. So simulation models have achieved prominence for this reason in the pandemic but in other spheres as well. They've been used in dozens of areas of health uh, to, to very good effect and uh, have roles increasingly within healthcare to uh, inform system design and uh, to study implement implementation issues as well as, as intervention uh, choice, et cetera. So, um, Simulations of these mo uh, models of these sort by capturing kind of posited causal structure of a system out there, the processes that we think may underlie what we observe, they have many, many uses. Um, they help us learn faster and more quickly from evidence. Um, they make explicit our mental models of causality and put them in the, the clear light of day for others to to critique, 
to, to discuss and refine. It takes it out of our head in an inchoate way and puts it in a way that's vulnerable, but helps us collectively advance it, helps us challenge it, um, and thereby learn. That's model structure, but by running the model, we can also test it against evidence. And models can serve as what-if tools to identify desirable policies, evaluate benefits of restructuring a system, for example, adopting more virtual care in delivery of, of mental health services, um, or, or speaking to uh, the benefits of, of restructuring a system with respect to cross-sector issues coming in and the domestic violence uh, area. Here, um, it can help us understand trends, um, help, help provide a basis for, for positing why we see a trend, and, um, and help prioritize data collection by running sensitivity analyses. So these tools, um, simulation models have many uses, and there's uses beyond these such as just bringing together stakeholders from diverse areas of the system to bring them onto the same page. But dynamic models have some big shortcomings. And many of these shortcomings have to do with their relationship to the external world, um, to data in the external world and to um, the processes in the external world. One of them is the fact that when we build a model, we often do so based on the situation when it's constructed. And we then use it for insight. We run scenarios and we study outputs from it. And, and that's good. Um, but the problem is that um, uh, as time goes on, it can become stale. It can become increasingly at odds with what's observed in the world. And of course we can, we could kind of restructure it, we can recalibrate it, we can reparameterize it. Um, but this is often a very heavyweight process. Um, it, it requires effort um, that is sub substantive. And that often means that a model will kind of go for many months without being recalibrated, potentially longer. A second challenge uh, is in some sense even deeper. There's this inevitable divergence between a model as in as much as it kind of mimics ph phenomena in the world, the underlying processes in the world. There's, there's often this big divergence between that model on the one hand and what's going on in the world. Um, and it's inevitable. Models are like maps. Um, uh, they're like maps in the sense that they, they, their very value um, is realized by omitting details. Um, uh, like a map, uh, a map, the only perfect map of the world, um, of course, is the world itself. Um, and that offers very little value, you know, as far as putting on your phone. Um, uh, models like maps um, secure their utility, their usability, by leaving out tremendous amounts of things. And which things are left out depends on the purpose of the model. But inevitably, as sort of simplified versions of the models, models will diverge in their evolution from the world. Um, there are stochastics in the model that no model can ever predict. Whether it's a weather model and we wanna understand you know, the weather a month from now, um, um, or whether it's a model of the evolution of COVID-19 and we're trying to understand what's likely to occur over the next six months, there's tremendous number of stochastic factors that a model can't possibly predict, um, factors that it can't possibly have an exact knowledge of how it will evolve. Um, the best traffic planning models within a city are never going to be able to know exactly what the statuses of each stoplight at what time or where the accidents will occur, which will gnarl up traffic. Um, so stochastics uh, occur in the world that no model can anticipate, um, but other factors occur in the world as well. A, a new variant arises, a new exogenous influence, you know, comes in from another sphere of the world for, for COVID-19, or um, a new therapeutic regimen is introduced 
um, or a new technology comes up for telemedicine, um, or you know, there's a um, there's a change in the economy which throws off the balance of uh, of stresses in the population that leads to more demand for mental health services. So inevitably, a model as built is going to diverge from what's going on in the world, um, and that limits its shelf life as built. Um, the third challenge is uh, one that you know, has been really emphasized in our work during the pandemic. Some of those present know that I was seconded for, for over a year to our health system, uh, where I served as co-director of the, uh, the modeling for the province. Um, and one thing that we were always running into there were shortages of evidence, particularly evidence with respect to human behavior. Um, and uh, this shortage of evidence, uh, despite today's uh, um, despite today's increasingly rich uh, information environment, um, still persists at this point. And I persist particularly keenly in certain spheres with respect to knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, health behaviors, and, and including risk and protective behaviors and other factors. And these three challenges that I've enumerated with dynamic models um, provide the la natural launching point for talking about the other major tradition here, data science. Um, and the data science tradition um, is focused more on the upper levels traditionally of this diagram. It's focused on the observed patterns. It's focused on what we actually observe from the world um, and in use of a uh, of a data, not only data informed, but often data driven strategy for making sense of the world. Um, it focuses on empirical evidence um, and it does aspire to push down from that empirical evidence. Whereas uh, system science kind of was focused on these areas and was cross checked against that empirical evidence. Um, so, Data science uh, is a broad area, and we'll be discussing later today the relationship between data science, big data, machine learning, AI, all this alphabet soup that people have been exposed to over recent years, and maybe wondering how they all relate to one another. But data science can be summarized as kind of uh, mechanisms, proceeds, principles, and practices, infrastructures. Um, and methodologies for drawing insight from data. And there's a particular focus and a particular position um, of, if not privilege of significance attached to big data. Um, and machine learning constitutes one of the, a key analysis tool. Um, within the health sphere, what we're going to be discussing this bootcamp, some data sources um, of sources of big data uh, for health. But what unites them all, there's a list of dozens that can be put together, and this is just some of them. But what unites them all are the four Vs. The fact they have big volume, that's the big and big data. They have high velocity. Um, so often the evidence comes in quickly uh, by epidemiological standards, daily or more, sometimes you know, on the order of minutes um, between measurements high variety, so a given data source will often have many particular things it measures, um, uh, and, and high veracity. Um, so often they, they have a more grounded measurement of, of certain types of, of things, such as uh, people's physical activity or eating behavior um, than would be, or, or weight and their weight evolution than would be gathered through traditional mechanisms. Um, now, traditional model um, machine learning tasks within data science um, uh, fall into a variety of areas. We'll talk about this more later today, um, but it, it just bears noting that there's different needs to which machine learning is, 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 is placed. Um, sometimes we wish to distinguish uh, different types of individuals based on their characteristics, for example, and we will do so using 
structure that we notice within the data to formulate rules uh, that will guide us for reliably classifying the data. Maybe we want to classify people's you know, of physical activity behaviors into a set of categories uh, distinguishing sedentary behavior such as that in which I am currently engaged sitting from standing behavior or walking behavior. Um, um, maybe we want to distinguish tweets by whether they, um, uh, they mention plausible cases of flu-borne illness, for example. Um, and we want to classify how well do they perform in terms of sensitivity and specificity, ability to detect it and reliability of saying, no, this is not an example of it. Um, uh, now, in this sphere, often, you know, traditionally uh, within machine learning um, or, or statistics, there were a set of, of methods focused on observables themselves. They might curve fit a set of observables involving patterns over time to find um, plausible projection of the current trajectory. Um, uh, and uh, increasingly, uh, those in machine learning turn to methods which involve recognizing latent structure of a process, that there's underlying patterns um, uh, that are not manifest in the data themselves directly, any one piece of data, but, but drive multiple types of data, um, something which draws this closer to system science and perspective. Now, common challenges with machine learning um, are, are also notable, just as system science um, uh, gave rise to many types of challenge, so it is with machine learning. Um, Three of the biggest spheres of challenge in machine learning and recognizing these structures from the world are, are given here. Um, one of them is this issue of, of explicability and, 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 and interpretation. If we're just recognizing these patterns in the data um, and formulating a rule based on them, often we don't have good theory as to why it is that one one thing is classified one way, one thing is classified another. We, we threat, you know, we, we risk having a, a black box that, that gives us this rather than a, a principled rule that we can explain to a decision maker. Or if we project forward where the number of cases are, we lack a story that goes along with it. Um, but a, a second issue is, is um, reasoning about um, things in the future relative to those in the past. Um, uh, and fundamentally, what we're dealing with in statistical models and traditionally in machine learning models, um, it, it, as those both have been pursued traditionally, are associations. It's one thing goes along with another. It's accompanied by another. But as we know, and as all of us have been, um, have been taught, we need to avoid the assumption that correlation implies causation. In fact, you can have correlation without causation. You can have causation without correlation. Um, uh, and you could, have, um, you could have certainly causation and correlation coming from that. Um, but the associations that we observe um, uh, empirically um, uh, aren't necessarily going to hold. Um, in the future. And the risk here uh, is that, you know, if we're counting on associations still holding, and they're not based on causal linkages, they're not based on, on causal relationships, um, we risk um, making, making choices about the future, which will be fraught when the situation, the data generating cha uh, process changes. It's a bit like looking at our rear view mirror as we're driving. If we're going around a racetrack, um, uh, perfectly circular or, or oval shaped, what we see out of our rear view mirror may be indicative of what's ahead. It's a very regular structure um, that going ahead is the same as going behind. Um, by contrast, if we're going off road, what we see out of rear view mirror may be very different from what's ahead. Um, 
uh, it won't capture the lake ahead or the cliff ahead or, or something along those lines. So the danger here is, um, you know, when it comes to, um, to, to reasoning about patterns in the world, um, we're not quite sure when they will still be reliable. Um, if the data generating process that gives rise to them changes, such as it might if we intervene in the system, or if a new therapy is introduced, or a new variant arrives, or there's a change in public attitude with respect to you know, adoption of mask use or, or, or new vaccines are rolled out. You know, these patterns, these associations we, change, we see, these patterns we try to fit um, may, uh, may change, may require alteration. And we're not sure how long they will, uh, they will persist. Um, so in the final component of this talk, I'm going to talk uh, about moving beyond both these traditions and their limitations by combining them together. And I'd like to hark back to this quote from epidemiologist Phil Zuckerman, which was relayed to me at one point by my fellow modeling colleague, Mark Orr. Uh, Phil Zuckerman commented, um, an epithiness worthy of uh, Zen koan, theory without data is myth and data without theory is madness. Um, and much of this talk, much of this boot camp, and indeed much of my, my research enterprise is focused on, on, uh, on you know, the implications of the need to move beyond myth and madness in order to, to, to complement these true traditions um, such that we can have a theory of the world that is constantly enriched with evidence, challenged by evidence, evolved with evidence, um, refined by evidence. Uh, and at the same time, um, one that we can understand rich empirical data in a way that builds new theory. Um, so the, the fundamental compatibility of data science and system science here is, is profound. I've held them up as two sort of contrasting traditions. Once, once, one of them based on an emphasis of theory of, of the desire to move beyond Plato's cave, move beyond focus on the shadows of what we see in empirical evidence and, and to reason about the underlying structure. Um, and on the other, you know, kind of a, a data-driven bottom-up set of observations that, that, um, that drive our understanding in a more, um, uh, in a more uh, elemental level involving the, uh, the data. But the truth is these are highly compatible. And, in the context of, um, of, of, of data science and system science, there are threads that unite them and that unite them as, as at least having a certain compatibility, having a certain um, consistent viewpoint or at least common thinking in certain areas um, and common uh, needs or, or potential. One of them is, is uh, uh, some of them are, are listed here and I'll, I'll go through um, a few of these. So um, uh, within the system science area, our systems data science area, I'll be emphasizing some of these components um, uh, successively here while uh, talking about other elements of this vision. Um, so uh, the first is, um, uh, this component of systems, uh, systems data science uh, has to do with the recognition to reason about the underlying system for interventions to have durable impact, to put in place fixes that stay fixed, to, put in, to move beyond um, uh, cases of policy resistance, cases where our policies are diluted or defeated um, pushed back against by the system, or we're working against, you know, we're trying to order back the tide. Um, and this capacity to reason about counterfactuals and interventions. Um, uh, I, I see 
you know, a, a common need here as being that of a realist perspective. Some of you, uh, some of the participants here may be familiar with the discipline of critical realism, um, uh, as came out of uh, the, the work of philosopher uh, Bhaskar, and um, uh, as recently well um, explicated by Pawson and Tilly, for example, in their work on realist evaluation. And the perspective here is one that empirical observations arise from underlying processes as data generating process. Um, statisticians speak about it just as much as system scientists. And uh, we recognize there's some underlying causal structure to the system. Um, uh, indeed, statisticians will often um, make, make note of, of uh, the desirability of, of theory here. And even data, you know, machine learning techniques, uh, contemporary ones, will point to the importance of recognizing latent structure of a system, underlying common structure that gives rise to the data. Um, uh, the processes here are, are dynamic, they evolve over time, and, and they're typically unobserved. They're, they're not directly observed. What we see from the world is kind of whispers of it, hints of this underlying structure, but we don't see it themselves. Um, and uh, statistical models seem to capture aspects of these data generating processes as they manifest in the data. And the da dynamic models focus on tension on the data generating process itself and how it evolves over time. So dynamic models um, in this context are, are commonly uh, the posited, represent the posited causal structure of the system to allow us to reason about the impacts of interventions here. Um, and as such, they allow us to move beyond looking at a rear view mirror to trying to look forward, generalize what we have seen out of rear view mirror to be sure in a way that is combined with theory about the system to anticipate what's coming up. Um, a second element that I wanna emphasize here is a recognition that different data sources are often drawn from an underlying unified coupled system. Far from being solitudes, these data sources are coupled. So, so the different data sources we see, like those data sources I showed up there on those slides early on from COVID-19 with test data and cases and hospital admissions and ICU, uh, ICU occupancy and deaths, those are not solitudes. Those are not you know, just worlds apart to each be analyzed uh, on its own in isolation. They're coupled. Um, they're speaking about a common underlying system. And traditionally, within the system science area, we've often been operating, trying to characterize systems based on just you know, small glimpses of pieces of the system. And what, what system science or what data science can bring us, particularly big data can often give us, is the capacity to reason about or to measure things at many other areas of a system, um, to give glimpses of other components of a system that will ground our dynamic models more effectively. Um, we've done some work, for example, with uh, service dogs and impacts on mental health and sense of well-being. With traditional instruments giving us just glimpses of a, at a few points within the system, but smartphones and wearables with which we were engaged with both the dogs and those um, and, and the veterans who, who had them, um, be able to pick up pictures on what was going on dynamically over time and many areas of the system to allow us to, to start to ground our thinking as to what's playing out here as a dynamic process in many, many different areas. Similarly for opioids, an example you'll hear later in the week, um, uh, we might have a, a model positing you know, flow, flow of, um, of individuals between different health states of, of say um, management of chronic pain with opioids, um, but uh, progression to a state of, um, of use of illicit drugs. 
and then potentially um, uh, being at risk of, of overdose, um, overdose deaths, uh, et cetera. And in a, uh, a modern data science context, we can evidence pieces of this system using a broader set of data. All those pieces of data relate to the same, same underlying system, but they, they pick up aspects of the system at different points. Wastewater might pick up aspects involving overall patterns of use of different substances within the population, both, both um, prescription narcotics as well as things like uh, fentanyl, heroin, uh, carfentanyl, and, and uh, illicit, uh, illicit opiates. Um, and opioids as well. Um, uh, beyond that though, we might have measurements from, for example, treatment volumes uh, or drug overdose deaths or, or prescriptions consumed, EMS responses, online search data or Google trend data involving different components of the system that kind of help us serve as measurement points along different areas of a system. Um, and that can help evidence our models over time. But another component of this is a commitment to models as learning tools and, and not models that you build once and then use for a long period of time, but models which are constantly learning from new evidence as it becomes available. Um, remember this notion of models as learning prostheses, models that help us learn more quickly um, we speak in the health system um, context commonly these days about learning health systems. Well, one of the best ways you can enable learning health system is by having ongoing modeling where the modeling is learning from the evidence, interpreting it, and is being cross-checked by those working with the model, the team working with the model, preferably an interdisciplinary team to to understand the degree to which the model's interpretations hold water. Um, so um, the goal here is to enact Francis Bacon's dictum um, of, of uh, having truth sooner emerging from error than from confusion by having a model constantly regrounded in the evidence, observing new evidence, trying to explain that new evidence and potentially falling short and needing to be extended or refined based on that. Um, uh, another component is learning from interventions. And here too, data science can help a great deal. One of the best ways a model can learn from the world is by anticipating with the model what's likely to happen in the context of intervening in the world in a certain way, and then actually measuring um, as an intervention takes place in the world, what actually happens. It's not quite a controlled experiment, but it is a is an experiment of sorts, a natural, not natural, but a an enacted experiment that can, can help refine model assumptions. It can help distinguish which pathways that are observed are major path drivers for the outcomes, particularly if you have measurements coming in from many areas of the system. Um, it can help identify primary reasons for the lack of intervention success uh, associated with this. This ability to observe what happens in response to an intervention and compare it to what we thought would occur um, can often help us really refine our models and really refine our understanding on what's going on out there in the world um, more effectively. Um, so, you know, within a system science context, um, we're often seeking to use measurement at many areas of a system to, to inform uh, that model, uh, to help distinguish, you know, pathways which are major drivers um, or those which are playing a big role for, for an intervention. Um, a, a final, um, component that I want to emphasize here is rich grounding of system-wide understanding, um, of understanding of a system without needing data measured from every part of a system. This is something which in data science has traditionally not been emphasized. And it's the idea that um, from a system science perspective, we're dealing with 
systems where, which are pervasively coupled. Um, what goes on in one area of the system ripples through to impact another area of the system. If we intervene in the emergency room in terms of uh, helping those who may be struggling with opioid addiction, what, what we do there will inevitably pop out in the detox centers or in, um, uh, in, the, uh, in terms of overdose uh, calls for EMSs somewhere else. Um, if we intervene in physicians' offices in terms of management of chronic pain with opioids, that will inevitably ripple through to that emergency room. These systems we're dealing with are coupled. They are, they are entangled. Um, and uh, as a result, the data that we observe in one area of the system is not merely about that area of the system. It whispers to us about the broader system. Uh, it whispers to us uh, about the system as a whole. And if you learn to listen to those whispers, and this much of this boot camp will be designed to do this, um, to, to allow you to do this, what, what data points in one area of the system tell you um, uh, concerns things not in just that area of the system, but things elsewhere within the system, throughout the system often. Um, and so we may have empirical data points, for example, involving number of cases of measles here. This is work by uh, T.A. Salian Li um, uh, that are observed over time. But what that's actually telling us, if we know how to interpret in the right way and we combine it with our understanding of system structure, is it's telling us something about different areas of the system. It's kind of like um, uh, a CAT scan machine where, um, when we image uh, any one area of the, the system uh, at a time with an X-ray, we won't, we won't make observations about all the system, but, uh, uh, but if we combine many images together, we can see the system as a whole. Uh, we can see aspects across the entire system. So here, this observation of cases over time gives rise to model picture of the number of people in different states, the number of recovered uh, kids, so the number of susceptible kids, the number of kids surely who are currently infectious, but also those who are exposed and not yet infectious, not yet represented in there. These data sources, um, the measurements in one area speaks to us about other areas of a system. Um, and uh, a set of measurements on, on one sphere here might might clue us in to what's going on throughout many different spheres uh, of the of the system. Um, so what we get out is a bit like population tomography. Um, some of you may be familiar with CAT scans. They take images from many different angles. Any one image is grievously limited. Um, it's from a certain slice. It has certain occlusions due to bones blocking the propagation of the, uh, the imaging. Um, it may have uh, omissions. It, it doesn't include many areas. But if we knit them together, um, what we get is, is a consistent picture of the system. And what we get out of this, um, uh, these sorts of methods um, uh, helps us uh, keep keep abreast of the system as it evolves over time. It's a bit like um, uh, keeping a, uh, a weather model abreast of what's actually happened uh, empirically in your, in your town or city. Um, uh, by so doing, the model stays constantly refreshed and we can use it to anticipate what's likely coming up in a, in a way that's much more accurate than if the model is just left um, unupdated. So a couple of key take home messages here. Um, as currently practiced, data science and system science um, are, are being pursued traditionally by different communities. Um, they, uh, they have some areas of overlap, but traditionally it's very little. Very few people circulate between the, the two spheres. Um, 
And uh, increasingly, there's a recognition that 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 while these two each have important pl- uh, roles to play, they each are associated with key shortcomings. And there's a need to bring the best of both, the best of data science and machine learning and AI and rich data sources and big data to combine it with system science approaches that have to do with theorizing about the world, with, with positing aspects of the structure of the world so we can ask about intervention effects, we can ask about counterfactuals. And by so doing, um, we can recognize a union that is, that is synergistic. And, and this enterprise of system data science um, poses the possibility um, and in fact, the realized, poss- increasingly realized possibility of reasoning robustly about counterfactuals, including the effects of interventions, while still being very data grounded, while still being grounded by, by rich evidence. Um, it helps us learn far faster and deeper from incoming evidence. Um, and, and by leveraging that evidence with theory helps us cross check that theory helps us challenge it and refine it. Um, It helps us recognize the system-wide implications of evidence drawn from particular areas of a system. Data from the emergency room is not just about the emergency room. It tells us about backups in the wards. It tells us about what's going on in the community if we know how to listen for it. Data from what's going on in, in, in the emergency room for opioids, pres- for opioids overdoses tells us something about the state of the treatment um, situation. It tells us something about uh, prescriptions of, of opioids for chronic pain and other factors. We just need to know how to listen to it. And this boot camp will provide you with the sort of ears that will help you listen for it, help you listen for those whispers and help you go from data about X to the implications about X, Y, Z, A, B, C. Um, Moreover, um, this systems data science can provide a common picture from evidence drawn from different areas of the system that in some sense triangulates from, it, it creates a unified picture. And it can help inform this understanding of the causal structure of the system that's more robust. It can also keep our models constantly updated, refreshed, not becoming obsolete, but becoming uh, increasingly um, relevant for what's likely to play out tomorrow. Um, And uh, they will do so by constantly challenging and, and informing our models with incoming data. Uh, in a way that reflects the growing availability of data for many spheres of public health and healthcare. So this is, this is sort of, these are some salient aspects of, of the systems data science perspective. Um, within this boot camp, we'll be seeing elements of this. Today, for the balance of the day, we're going to be building up some basic understanding of um, the, the constituent components here of, of data science. We'll be starting to look at elements of big data, understanding this relationship, as I had mentioned, of AI, machine learning, and big data, and data science um, together, where they all fit in, and where you know, the sort of elements of, of system science, like dynamic modeling, fit into that picture. We'll also talk about three system science traditions, oft practiced in isolation, but increasingly woven together. Um, Compartmental or system dynamics modeling, agent-based modeling, and and discrete event simulation. We'll see see what each of those brings to the table. Um, And then tomorrow, we'll be poised to sort of transition on to some of the first truly systems data science uh, tools that will help us get on our way for knitting together a whole greater than the sum of the parts, bringing together 
uh, the sorts of system science methods like dynamic modeling with rich data sources that are constantly uh, regrounding them. So that's, that's the overall plan. Um, so uh, just stopping my, um, uh, my slides here, uh, I am going to uh, just use this opportunity to invite any, uh, any questions that people would like to ask. Any discussions people would like to have? So I'm, I'm watching the chat, if anyone would like to go there. Um, someone told us data scientists ask the question and data analyst answers the question. I, I, I think many would disagree with that. Um, data scientists are often involved directly in an analysis of the data and uh, data analysts uh, are often employing data science techniques. And so if you wanna exclude data analysts as kind of lower level data scientists, you could, but I think that's more of an organizational distinction than a substantive one. Um, uh, one thing that is true is that commonly in, in instantiating um, uh, and realizing data science in practice, uh, there's a separation between data engineers who are involved in putting in place the infrastructure to realize data science tools, um, the pipelines, the high performance databases, knitting together the, uh, uh, the, the distributed computation architectures, those are different from the data scientists. But data scientists can also include uh, individuals of a wide variety of areas. And data scientists um, will often include the analysts themselves that they'll be pursuing um, uh, data science. Now, it is true that there can be, you know, higher level data scientists that will pose some suggestions for approaches. They will say, let's try this deep learning method or this deep learning architecture together with, um, you know, this Bayesian approach within this area and you know, they'll ask people to go to actually perform the analyses. But in my experience, it's a rare data scientist who's not face-to-face -face with some of the data themselves uh, fairly frequently because data science is in large part about finding the regularities in the data, um, letting the data you know, uh, uh, speak in terms of, of, of showing its structure. And, and data scientists need to be aware of the broad features of that structure in order to, um, in order to suggest models um, that are applicable, in order to suggest architectures that are applicable, um, say for a deep neural network or what have you. And so I, I don't think it's, it's that simple about asking and answering data scientists, asking data analysts answering. I think it's, um, uh, you'll, you'll find uh, there's a lot going on on both, both sides of that. Um, uh, so um, let's see, uh, some more, more comments. Glad if, it's, uh, if that was uh, useful. Alex, um, taking the epidemic as an example, uh, could we say from a system science perspective, source of all systems, uh, of all the systems was lab data. In this sense, addressing this more of a data science uh, application. Um, uh, source of all this, okay. Um, okay, I'm not, not sure what was meant by the source of all the systems was laboratory data. I think what's maybe, maybe being taught that uh, there's lab data being, uh, being produced. Well, um, it is true that there's lots of lab data being produced for the, um, uh, for the, uh, the, the pandemic. Um, so when we look at uh, data on testing and, and cases, uh, uh, we, we were operating with lab data. When we look at data on the fraction of different variants, um, you know, currently um, uh, in place, uh, we'll be operating off of lab data, et cetera. 
Um, but there's more than that. Um, so uh, there's a lot of data critical to understanding the, uh, the pandemic, which comes from health services, you know, admissions to ICU, uh, uh, admissions to the hospital ward, non-ICU hospital wards, um, number, of, uh, uh, number of people in the overnight census, the midnight census in, in the ICU ward or what have you. Um, um, and um, I wouldn't I wouldn't call that um, lab data. I I call it you know um, uh, uh, data from from health service delivery processes and capacity utilization data. Um, beyond that, um, uh, a lot of data which has 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 played a more prominent role in this outbreak than it did say in the H one N one pandemic or in the SARS pandemic. Um, has been social media data um, or uh, data from smartphones on, on mobility patterns, um, both of which have lent some important insights into, um, uh, into you know, the, the patterns we do see in the pandemic. And, and I wanna highlight here from my perspective, um, in perspective as a system scientist, um, the fact that you know when we when we think about the drivers for infection spread, um, we have to recognize that it goes beyond just pathogen transmission, as important as that is, as obviously central as it is, um, and it goes beyond biomedical processes and people's you know interactions. Uh, or natural history of infection once infected, you know, asymptomatic pathway, symptomatic pathway, et cetera. It's more than that because it involves behavior, um, involves risk behavior, attitudes, uh, knowledge, attitudes, beliefs with respect to mask use and with respect to vaccination, with respect to willingness to engage in social distancing and, and working from home, um, engagement in gatherings. Um, and there, um, you know, the, the amount that we get through lab data is, is very limited, of course. Um, what we can gain is much more insight with social media and smartphone-based data collection and, and tools that help us better understand how people are behaving. And, you know, that ended up, um, you could say it's the tail that wagged the dog here, right? Um, uh, the uptake rates for vaccines, you know, end up playing a major role in subsequent epidemiology. But um, uh, more than that, all through the pandemic, people's willingness to engage in social distancing was a big determinant. And where one sees that is in social media, but social media is not merely a reflection of, but a driver of this behavior. And, and again, this is kind of wearing my data science hat, right? I mean, um, but, but thinking as a system scientist as well, systems data scientist. Um, we, we need to recognize that social media is not just kind of a epiphenomenal, you know, place where we can uh, record epiphenomenal measurements of people's thoughts and attitudes with respect to mask use or social distancing. It's actually a driver for attitudes that then manifest in, in, in risk behaviors in the population. And um, those were some of the biggest drivers, you know, for the epidemiology. It's, how people behaved. Um, so I, I think of um, lab data is critical. Um, it's, it's super valuable and new types of lab data emerged. Absolutely, Hind is absolutely right. Um, central wastewater data being a, a really valuable example that has huge implications uh, across many conditions, many spheres. Um, but, you know, um, uh, I think, it'll behoove us to think about not only measuring what's going on in the underlying system, but think about drivers for the underlying system to think about things far other than, than lab data, things that might be picked up on social media, for example. Um, and uh, I think we have a lot to learn there still. And we'll have, um, uh, we'll have some lectures within this boot camp and case studies that, that um, speak about that. Um, Let's see, uh, so great, great comments. Uh, what can I say about the COVID-19 pandemic? 
<laughs> yeah, I could speak about the COVID-19. Okay, so, so there'll be a time where I promise I'll speak about that. Now it's not the, the time. Um, uh, I'm, I'm constantly, uh, you know, um, updating my understanding and evidence with respect to the, the current situation with the COVID-19 pandemic and still very, very involved uh, with the modeling team here. And um, uh, I do have some thoughts about that. Um, um, uh, yeah, so social media is a driver. Glad if that's useful. I think we can't ignore it, right? And we can't ignore it. It's not just health, but it's other areas. I mean, uh, social media um, is is something that um, if 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 we're not if we're not recognizing social media as a as a uh, a, a potent factor in and of itself, um, a potent driver. Um, as well as, as well as kind of uh, uh, manifestation, I think increasingly we're missing out a really big component of the of, of of the system of what's going on, and proactive, you know, proactive uh, parties within this area are looking how can we fly ahead of that plane. Um, the social media in the social media sphere, uh, in other words, not. Um, not be merely, you know, uh, broadsided by changes in attitude and social media, but how can we um, counter conspiracy theories and counter, you know, baseless claims? And how can we sooner um, uh, get the facts out there and and recognize common misunderstandings, et cetera? That that has to be part of modern health practice. Um, uh, certainly in the area of risk communication, but in areas beyond beyond risk communication, um, uh, this this has to be a, a component of the strategy. I one of the roles I, I play is I'm honored over many many years to have to be contributing to a, a course in uh, health risk communication uh, at Harvard School of Public Health, um, in where we where we talk about the roles played by these tools of data science, um, uh, social media, smartphone-based data collection, search data in, in informing uh, risk communication efforts. And, um, and you know, there's an absolute need to, to tap social media there and to recognize that we're dealing with diverse communities. Uh, we're recognized that we're dealing with um, uh, uh, different subparts of the population. Um, uh, with with different um, knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, vulnerabilities, uh, et cetera. And there's a need to, to recognize that um, in terms of risk communication strategies and, and to leverage and adapt strategies based on what's uh, observed in social media. So I'm, I'm a big believer that that's an important component of it. And there's been some very interesting modeling work done. Uh, I would particularly highlight the work of Epstein um, both um, as it was published 10 years ago and more recently, uh, highlighting the joint epidemics of, of uh, pathogen and fear 10 years ago, and then more recently talk about the triple epidemics um, uh, that, that are playing out in the COVID-19 context. And I believe it's an important perspective, but again, it brings home the need to bring systems modeling reasoning, reasoning about the dynamics of the system, the structure of the system that gives rise to that dynamics with observations from the world, such as by social media. Um, any, other, any other comments there? We're due for a health break here in, in just a minute, but anyone else wanna, wanna speak up or, or um, uh, post anything in the chat? Going once, going twice. Okay, um, so um, uh, I think we'll we'll take a health break now, um, and we'll reconvene at um, at forty five past. Uh, so that's another twenty or so minutes here. Um, and what we're going to 
go into there is um, is just a, as I said, the rest of the day, a lot of it is just reminders of, uh, uh, or building, so we're, we're on the same playing field with respect to uh, these two areas, data science, system science. I, I gave a very broad brush characterization, particularly in the data science side here, just really glossing over a lot of, of big issues. And we're gonna, we're gonna dive deeper into each of these areas. So 1045, I'm gonna be talking about three major traditions of dynamic modeling, compartmental system dynamics modeling, um, agent-based modeling, and, and uh, discrete event simulation, all of which have huge roles that they have played and are playing um, in, in health. Uh, in the afternoon, we're gonna be going into you know, the data science side in much more detail um, and talk about some of these common techniques that are, that are explored with machine learning, for example, and classification and prediction and some of the different terminology that's involved there, et cetera. Uh, so, so 1045, uh, my time, uh, whatever 45, your time. Let's, let's meet back here and uh, we'll get going on some aspects of system science. If you wanna follow along with any logic, now would be a good time to make sure it's installed because I'll be referring to some models that we posted up there and uh, some of which are, um, we'll also use some built-in models. So thank you very much. Take care there. Um, and, oh, there's uh, something from a TA. Um, yeah, uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'll be making, um, uh, making the uh, TA's, uh, uh, TA's co-host here. Thank you and see you in a few minutes. Take care there.